times have you worked on a problem and it just kept recurring? It happens to all of us. I think about an oncology clinic that had a recurring problem with doctors not signing notes before chemo treatments, which left patients waiting in the chair for infusions and staff running in circles to get the note signed. The clinic director and staff spent two years trying to solve this problem. They wrote new rules, displayed incentive boards, built a system of daily reminders, but the problem persisted. So when this happens, what's missing? Very often, you don't understand the root cause of your issues. So you don't create improvements that work. A common reason that changes fail to deliver the results you hope for is because they failed to address the root cause of the problem. A root cause is the deepest level cause that sets in motion the entire cause and effect reaction that ultimately leads to the problem. By the end of this video, you will know how to brainstorm a broad set of causes and perform a root cause analysis using the five whys or a cause and effect diagram. There are four simple steps Step one, bring your team together. Root cause analysis requires multiple inputs. It does not work alone in an office. Step two, write the problem to keep your team focused. Otherwise, it's easy to drift into solving a different problem. Step three, brainstorm the high-level issues. A high-level approach ensures you don't miss important causes and prevents tunnel vision. Step four, drill down to the root causes. Use a five whys analysis or a cause and effect diagram to analyze the problems. Step one and two are essential and prepare us for a brainstorm in steps three and four where we spend more time to figure out what is at the root of our problem. Let's learn how to do five whys with an example from my life early in 2020. As we began to shelter in place, my second grader needed to learn to write personal narratives from the dining room by himself instead of from his classroom with his teacher's guidance. My son spent a lot more time wiggling staring blankly at the computer and having mom and dad to yell exasperatedly, just focus, than time actually spent writing. I assumed the problem was focus and the solution was to hold him on my lap so he couldn't move and to clear all the distractions off the table. It didn't help. I realized we needed to drill down to the root causes and analyzing why the writing wasn't getting done. Step one, I get together with my team, me and my son. It would have been much easier for me to do the root cause analysis on my own, but I would have made wrong assumptions about what my son was thinking. Step two, we write our problem as a gap. We want to decrease time spent writing by 16 minutes, from an average of 31 minutes per day to 15 minutes per day. Step three, we start our brainstorm by moving the problems we identified into our five whys. Why is it taking 31 minutes instead of 15? Because I don't have any good ideas. Because it's hard to write. Because mom and dad keep giving me more work. We continue our brainstorm by thinking of other potential causes. My son says he needs time. It's a very common mistake to stop at causes that are too general. Not enough time, poor communication, lack of accountability. Those don't have enough detail for us to eliminate the problem. So we drill to the next level of why, beginning step four. These are called the five whys because you should ask why roughly five times. It could be more, it could be less. It's more about getting to the root of the issue than counting whys. So let's get back to our questions. He answered that he would like to hear the instructions, work on something else, and then come back to it. That sounds like jumping to a solution, which is probably the most common mistake in improvement projects. There's often something valuable in the solution, so I asked why he would want to pause and come back to his writing. He explained he needs to let his brain process the assignment. I thought that was very insightful. Let's keep going. My son often rejects his writing ideas when they don't work out right away. Why? Because he's a perfectionist. Wait, that doesn't sound very useful. It's a very common mistake during root cause analysis to blame a person. That's the way they are. There's almost always a systemic issue that makes these problems likely to happen. And these systemic issues can be addressed. Focus instead on the process that makes the behavior likely. We just change the emphasis from being his fault to figuring out what pieces could be actionable. Let's move on. My son said his personal narrative needs to be real, recent, and exciting. Why, why, and why? Because the examples he saw were all realistic. Because it's hard to remember details from a long time ago. And he keeps rejecting ideas because he says he hasn't done anything exciting recently. Why? Because he hasn't left the house. Because we're sheltering in place. I stopped this line of questioning here since we don't have control over whether we are sheltering in place. Continuing down this path will cause us to spin. 
So we realize we've made it as far as we can with asking why. That was the five whys analysis. We kept asking why until we got to the underlying cause of the problem. It helped us move away from jumping to solutions and allowed us to figure out what was really getting in our way of being able to write a personal narrative. Summarized here are the common mistakes we just discussed. You may want to pause to take a longer look. Before we move off of five whys analysis, let me introduce you to Shanae Lawrence. When you see it and you fix it, you're only putting a Band-Aid on it and it doesn't solve the problem, which is why you should do the root cause analysis because during that thing, you'll also identify other things you never even thought of. You may say, okay, well, the call light didn't go off and you think, oh, we're just gonna fix the call light. But what you didn't realize is there was no secretary to answer the call light because your staffing is short. You have to understand what the problem is. So the very first thing I would do is do, the, do your flowchart, walk through the process of like what you expected it to do. What was it exposed to look like? That's the number one. Then after that, you can bring, you go through and say what went wrong each step and you know, make it about the system and not about the person. That's one thing I do want to stress about root cause analysis. The point is not about to blame a person. We are looking at the system's issues. Every person wants to do the right thing, but if they don't have a good system to help them, they're never going to be able to do that right thing. So focus on the systems issue as you go through each of these steps. And then from there, then you look at, okay, what made this issue go wrong? And just keep going, breaking it down and breaking it down. And I promise you will get to the root cause of your problem. The other way to analyze root causes is with a cause and effect diagram. These were developed in the 1940s to understand problems by explaining how a complex set of factors could be related. They have standard categories and the advantage is that by reviewing each category, you are likely to catch causes you missed in the current state analysis. Cause and effect diagrams are also called fishbone diagrams because they look like fish. To create a cause and effect diagram, first put the problems in the fish's mouth. This is the effect. Next, list the categories as the fish bones. You can brainstorm your own categories or use the six M's. Methods, also known as processes. Materials, such as supplies. Man, we have updated this to people. Measurement, machines or equipment, and mother nature or environmental factors. Focus on brainstorming and don't worry about getting everything into just the right spot. Within the categories, add the causes that impact the effect. Let's go back to the oncology example from the beginning of this video. The physicians were the main stakeholders in closing encounters. So I started by asking them what was getting in their way. The immediate answer was, we have limited time to complete our notes. After some debate, we decided to include that in environment. And during the debate, we discovered some of the whys that were in other categories. In methods, they double booked and have no built-in breaks in their schedules. In environment, they have many interruptions. In people, they have many regular patient questions to answer and limited RN support. As a team, we did not come up with any reasons within the materials or machines categories. These categories are meant to help brainstorm and make sure you don't miss something important. So it's okay that we don't have something in each one. We reviewed our completed fishbone diagram. The physicians realized they didn't simply need more time. They wanted to wait to write their notes until they had a block of time. This insight led us to create a dot phrase with the minimum information the pharmacists and nurses needed to proceed. The physicians were able to complete the dot phrase quickly and then go back later and add more detail to their chart. This brought their compliance from 63% to 92% and made for much happier patients and staff. What a difference from the two years they spent working on the problem without getting to the root cause. Having fishbone categories did help me think of other potential causes for my son's writer's block, but I find using five whys analysis to be more intuitive. In practice, I use both depending on the team I'm working with. You can decide which method you prefer to use. As you are performing root cause analysis, allocate more time to categories you think are more likely to be an issue. Remember, the goal is not to document every tiny possibility, but to instead make sure you don't miss anything important. In this video, you learned how to brainstorm a broad set of causes and perform a root cause analysis using either the five whys or a cause and effect diagram. Now you can go forth and work in a team and have fun identifying your root causes, but know that you can't make changes for every single potential root cause. You'll want to work on the causes that will have the most impact, and we'll cover that in the next video on prioritizing the vital few.